Well, hello everyone, and welcome to Basic Gospel, a media ministry dedicated to helping you hear, believe, and live the good news of Jesus Christ. With Bob Christopher, I'm Bob Davis, and today we begin a new teaching series that Bob will be telling you all about in just a moment. But before we begin, I want you to know that although our listener line is always open for you at 844-322-2742, we'll not be taking live phone calls today. So if you need answers for the challenges of everyday living, or if there's a Bible passage you can't quite understand, we'll use that number and leave us a voicemail. Again, it's 844-322-2742. Please remember, we always loving, uh, love hearing from you, our listeners. But for right now, it's our new teaching series, and here to tell us all about it is Bob Christopher. Well, Bob, as you, you said, uh, our broadcast is about people hearing, believing, and living the good news through faith in Jesus Christ. Well, who in the world is this Jesus Christ? And that's what our study is all about, is taking a look at Jesus Christ and determining what the Word of God says about him and coming to this point of believing believing who he really is. Now, when we say that, uh, we know that the Bible reveals to us that Jesus claims to be the I am. And so the title of this particular teaching series is The Great I Am. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're going to get to Jesus, and we're going to spend a lot of time looking at what Jesus said about himself and how his claim to be the I am impacts you and me, how it changes our lives, how it meets every need of the human heart, how he meets every need of the human heart. Why do we search for meaning and purpose in life? Because we haven't found it in the person of Jesus Christ. Why are we looking to fill the emptiness in our hearts? Because we haven't been filled by Jesus Christ. Uh, why are we looking for sustenance in life? Why are we looking for wisdom and light and knowledge? Because we haven't found all of those things in the person of Jesus Christ. So we are people apart from Christ who are wanting. We are lacking significant uh, pieces mm -hmm. to make right. life really a human life. And so we're going to take a, a, a lot of time looking at Jesus Christ and all the claims that he made about himself. But before we do that, we're going to go back into the Old Testament and we're going to make some connections between the God of the Old Testament and Jesus Christ himself. And this is really a fascinating story. We're going to go back to Exodus chapter 3. And there Moses is uh, in the area of Midian. He is uh, uh, watching his flocks and those sort of things. And there's a bush, and it starts to burn, uh, but it doesn't burn. There's just a fire in it. And from that bush, uh, Moses hears a voice, and this voice says, come here. And as Moses approaches, the voice says, take off your sandals because this is holy ground. And we're going to pick up the conversation in verse 7 of Exodus chapter 3. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in, G in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt." But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, But I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will serve God on this mountain. So there's the conversation that God had with Moses, and it all revolves around the people of Israel that had been in bondage to the Egyptians for almost 400 years. Yeah. And God is saying, I have come down to do something on their behalf. So let's just make some observations uh, from this these verses that we've just read. 
So the first is that the Lord appeared to Moses in a burning bush. The second is that he told Moses he had seen the affliction of his people, had heard their cries, and knew their sufferings. Mm -hmm. Uh, So God is not blind to what we go through. God is not blind to what we experience, the trials and tribulations that we go through on a day-to-day basis. He's not uh, deaf to the cries of our hearts. He hears those things, and that's what we see in this particular passage, that God is saying to Moses, listen, I have seen the affliction of my people. I have heard their cries. I know their sufferings. I know exactly what they're going through. Now, this is huge uh, for us on an individual basis. All of us uh, have afflictions. All of us have cries that come from the heart. All of us experience sufferings. And oftentimes we think God is looking in a different direction. He doesn't know what we're going through. Mm -hmm. And yet here in this particular story, we see that God knew the cries and the sufferings and the afflictions of his people who had been bound up in Egypt for all of this time. So he had seen the afflictions and the the third observation that he had come down to do something on their behalf. He not only heard their cries, he not only knew their sufferings, he had not only seen their afflictions, he had come on the scene to do something about it. Talk about good news. (laughs) Uh, And he came down specifically to deliver them from bondage to deliver them out of the hands of their taskmakers and to take them to a new place. So that was the plan of God for the people of Israel way back then. Mm -hmm. Now, the fourth thing is that he picked Moses to be the man to lead his people out of Egypt. Now, God could have done this all by himself. He didn't need Moses. He didn't need anybody to help him in this regard. He was going to be the one to deliver the people. But God, since he created us in his image uh, and to be participators in this creation that he brought about in, in tilling the land and doing all the things that God commissioned Adam and Eve to do way back uh, in Genesis chapters 1, two, uh, 1 and 2, he wants us to participate in his work. So he chooses to work through human agents. And Moses happens to be the one that he chooses to be the leader to take the people out of Egypt and and take them into a new take them to a new place. Now that's good news as well, that God is going to work through us in this world today that we are going to be his mediators in this world, sharing the good news of Jesus to people uh, wherever we encounter them and get and engage them in conversation. So that's how God has chosen to work um, since the very creation of mankind. Yeah. He's chosen us to participate in his work in this world. Now, the fifth observation about this particular passage is this, is that Moses was perplexed by God's choice. Uh, Who am I? Why in the world would you pick me? I mean, I murdered one of one of uh, uh, one of the Egyptians and, and boy, your people got mad at me and I was almost killed as a result. Why? Why would you pick me a murderer to do such a task? Now, the same is true of us. Why would he pick us to do anything? Well, because he chooses to do so. He wants us to participate in the work that he's doing in this world today. He wants us to participate in his great rescue mission that he set out uh, to do through Jesus Christ. Now, here was God's answer to Moses' objection. He said, God declared that he would be with Moses, and he says this, that I will be with you. Now, it's interesting because this phrase, I will be, is the actual name of God. It's it's a, a variation on the word 
Yahweh. Mm -hmm. And, And so it's saying, hey, the one who has always existed, the one who will forever exist, is going to be with you. The one who spoke this world into existence, the one who met with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and said, through you, the world is going to be blessed. This is the one that is going to be with you. So God right here is giving out his name, yeah. is telling Moses something about himself, about his character. And he's saying, this is the one that is going to be with you. So you have nothing to fear. You have nothing to worry about because I'm with you. I, I'm more powerful than Pharaoh. I have more power than he does. I can release the people. I can set them free. You just participate. You just choose to participate in what I'm going to be doing. And then he says, this is going to be the sign for you that when all of this happens, you're going to come back to this very place. And in this particular passage, it's called Mount Horeb, uh, but that is another name for Mount Sinai. You're going to come back to this very place and you're going to worship me and serve me on this on this mountain. Yeah. And we know that's exactly what happened. Once the exodus had taken place, the people of Israel gathered at the foot of Mount Sinai and Moses went up on the mountain and served God mm-hmm. at that very place. Yeah. So this one who is the great I am, the one who uh, will be with them, uh, not only now, but in the future, brought it all about. Yes. Well, this is Basic Gospel, everybody. This is lesson one of our new series, The Great I Am, with Bob Christopher. I'm Bob Davis. Thank you for joining us. And friends, our charge here at Basic Gospel comes from God, and that charge is to deliver the message of love, grace, and life in Jesus Christ to everyone who has ears to hear. And one of the ways God validates the message through Basic Gospel is through the generosity of our listeners, for whom we are deeply grateful. Friends, if you haven't yet joined with us, we invite you to come alongside of us and partner with us. Help us keep this good news coming. You can donate now or anytime at basicgospel.net. And speaking of the good news, we're off to a great start in this first installment of this new series, The Great I Am. And here again is Bob Christopher. Well, thanks, Bob. So we made some observations about this passage in Exodus 3, verses 7 through 12. Let me ask some questions in response to that. Mm -hmm. And these are personal questions, ones that that you can contemplate and consider. And as you do, uh, I think uh, it, it's really going to be meaningful to you. So the first thing is this. The first question is this. Do you know and believe that God has heard your cries, that he knows your afflictions and sufferings? So he comes down and makes a statement to Moses. I have heard the cries of my people. I know their afflictions. I know their sufferings. Do you believe the same is true of you, that God has heard your cries. The second question is this, do you believe that he has come down to deliver you from bondage and to deliver you to a new place or a new way of life? And if so, who is the person he sent to lead you out of the realm of sin and death and to raise you up so that you can walk in the newness of life? Well, fast forward to the New Testament that person is Jesus. So Moses had said, and it's recorded, I think, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 15, he says, a prophet like me is going to be raised up, and this prophet is going to have the words of eternal life. This is the one that you need to listen to. Expect his coming, look forward to his coming, and then when he arrives, listen to him. Tune your ears to what he is saying, and if you believe then you will experience new life. You will be released from the realm of sin and death, raised to walk in the newness of life. Now, we're going to continue on in this particular passage, verses 13 through 15. Then Moses said to God, so he's raised one objection. He's basically going to raise another objection. If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, Now, when he's saying the God of your fathers, he is specifically saying the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That that is how God has identified himself in the past. 
and he's identified himself both in name and kind of in story that he has entered into a story, a relationship, a covenant with man, and it goes from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob and then the 12 sons, and he's the God of that that group. So he says, uh, what if they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? He said, listen, who am I that I should go? Mm-hmm. And then he's saying, I don't even know your name. I mean, you're a, a voice from a burning bush. You claim to be uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob, but I don't know your name. I don't know you. So why in the world are you picking me? Well, God said to Moses, and here's what we need to really pay attention to as far as this passage is concerned. He says, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Now, God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. So there was a word in the Old Testament, Elohim. Uh, It is basically a generic word for God. So we have the word God that we use in our English language, and it's a generic word. Uh, People of many different faiths and beliefs and walks of life uh, use the word God, but that word is generic. And so God is saying, okay, I want to take this generic word and I want to give it uh, something unique. And so there may be other gods, for example, uh, in the Ten Commandments, God said, I I want you to have no other gods, Elohim, Mm -hmm. before me. Um, So he's he's saying, I'm distinct from everything else that you may think of as God. Mm -hmm. I'm unique. I've always existed, and I will always exist. I've existed, I am, and I will. That's that's who this God is. And so this is his name forever. So let's make let's make some observations. So Moses still isn't sure that he is the one for the job. He doesn't know God's name. How could he be the one? So he asked God, what is your name? And God answered, I am. And in some translations, it's I will be uh, who I will be meaning that I will never be anything other than who I am. So it's a word that's saying I exist. And it's a, it's a word that talks about the character, the essence, the reality of who God is. So he says, I am who I am. This is a progressive present. Um, so he's, he's not... Uh, You know, he's not past tense. He's not future tense. He's just this progressive presence. Uh, So whenever tomorrow comes, he's going to be the I am for us. Whenever uh, the next year comes, he's going to be the I am for us. That's who he is. And the same that he is today is what he's going to be tomorrow and what he'll be next year and what he'll be 100 years from now. That's just who God is. So God's forever name is his essence, Yahweh. And this was an unspoken term as far as the Hebrews were concerned. Mm -hmm. It wasn't something that they pronounced. Uh, It wasn't something that they spoke uh, in their their language. Uh, And even in their English translations of the Old Testament, uh, they will they will spell this word G D right. to indicate the sacredness, the holiness of God's name. We know it as the Tetragrammaton, the four words that are not to be uttered. Uh, that's what that's what that means. Um, it's Yahweh. That's the name of God. When He speaks it, He says, "I am." When we say it. We say, you are. That's the name of God. Mm -hmm. So what does God's name mean to you? Um, That's a question. What does the fact that God's name is I am, what does that mean 
to you. It means that whatever you're going through right now, God is sufficient to meet your need. Absolutely. Whatever is happening in your life right now, God is sufficient to overcome it or to walk you through it. You never have to look anywhere else except to the great I am to meet every need that you have at any given time in your life. That's what it means to know God as the great I am. Yeah. Now, in what ways, uh, let's make this a little practical, in what ways does his name change your view of your circumstances? And I hope that his name gives you a sense of hope in the midst of whatever circumstances you're going through. That's certainly what it gave the people of Israel. They knew that a deliverer had come, a person who had heard their cries, who had the power not only to speak the world into existence, but to consider them and deliver them to a new land. Yes, indeed. What a great uh, what a great story, Bob. Thank you for that. And friends, we want to invite you to join the live video stream of this program each day from either Facebook or YouTube, and you'll find direct links right at the top of our homepage. That, of course, is at basicgospel.net. All you need to do is click one or the other of those links, and then about one minute before the top of the hour, 3 p.m., you can uh, go there and you can uh, join in the live program that starts every day live at 3 p.m. Central Time. So take advantage of that. Again, those links at the top of the homepage at basic gospel.net. Well, thanks, Bob. We're going to fast forward now to the New Testament. So we have the backdrop, the setting for our study is uh, on the great I am, Jesus Christ. And we're going to move forward to John chapter 8. And Jesus is having a conversation with the Pharisees. And they ask him, are you greater than our father Abraham who died? This is chapter 8, uh, verses 53 through 59. And who did you make yourself out to be? Uh, Jesus is making some claims that if they believe in him, then they're going to experience freedom. If the son has set you free, you'll be free indeed. Anyone who sins is a slave to sin. That's the context of this particular conversation. And they're saying, well, who do you think you are? I mean, you're just, you're just a man like you and like you and like me, like we are. That's all you are. You were born in Bethlehem, raised in Nazareth. You have parents. You have flesh and blood. Who in the world do you think you are? And Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say is our God. So I have a Father. He's your God. But you have not known him. I know him. And it goes on. And he says, uh, before Abraham... Uh, was I am. That's what Jesus claimed about himself. They wanted to know who he was. He brings them back to Abraham, saying, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it, and it was glad. This confused them, and he says, you're, you're not even 50 years old. And he said, before Abraham was, I am. Mm. Ego, I me, yeah. is the Greek phrase. And it's the exact same word in Greek that was used in Hebrew mm. as far as God's name. Jesus is the great I am. He is the one that has come to deliver you yeah. from sin and death, to deliver you from darkness into light, to cross you over from death to life. Jesus Christ, who is he? He is the great I am. Indeed he is. Thank you, Bob. Wonderful, wonderful story, wonderful news for us here at Basic Gospel. Well, we're glad that you were here today for session one of our new study series, The Great I Am. And if you have questions you'd like us to address, well, leave us a voicemail at 844-322-2742. We would love to hear from you. And again, that number, 844-322-2742. And, of course, thanks to everyone who supports this ministry with your love, your prayers, and your gifts. And to help with a gift today, which we hope you'll do, just click Donate at BasicGospel.net. That's our website, BasicGospel.net. We hope you'll go there right now and join us in proclaiming this good news of Jesus Christ. Well, now for Bob Christopher and the ministry team, I, Bob Davis, inviting you back again on Monday for Basic Gospel. Have a great weekend, everybody. Bye-bye.